Hello, everyone. Um, and uh, as some of you know, I'm Dr. Neamtu with uh, geriatrics. Uh, I'll be very happy to talk to you about geriatrics uh, and medications today. Please feel free to stop me if you have any questions uh, or anything to say, to add, to comment. Uh, again, I'll be more than happy uh, to answer as we go along or to discuss issues and also um, at the end, of course, like always in lectures, uh, you are more than welcome to answer questions. I hope you will find this useful because, as you may have noticed, we have more and more uh, patients that are older, very complex patients, and um, and actually we expect more to more older patients to come and to uh, need att our attention. So um, not only that they are very complex, but with that comes a lot of uh, medication that they bring. And this is really a challenge for a physician, especially for primary care physicians, but also for all the others working uh, in medical field. So um, I'll just mention a few general considerations. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about Birk's criteria. I gave some handouts. Uh, handout. I have one more if somebody needs. Um, the, a, a COVID project, and then we'll talk a little bit about the adverse drug events, polypharmacy, and I would like to mention a few medications that we need to um, uh, pay attention to when we treat patients with uh, for sleep problems or for delirium. So we know that prescribing medications for uh, older adults is actually challenging, is not easy. And uh, there are many reasons for that. One is the fact that the drug trials that um, have been, you know, have been done actually were done on older, on younger adults. Um, now we are starting to see more and more older adults being involved in, uh, in trials, but uh, so far not too many. And then with uh, aging, there are many changes in pharmacokinetics and in pharmacodynamics, actually, of the drugs. So I just mentioned a few changes in volume distribution. It's because there is more uh, fat in older people and less uh, muscle mass, actually. And also uh, there is a decrease in drug clearance. That's because the kidney function is not um, um, the same as in younger adults. Also the, the, the liver is not working the same. And there is, an, actually there is an increased sensitivity to the effects of the drugs themselves. So um, I want you to keep in mind something because I've noticed um, one thing that repeats uh, when we treat older adults, we give, we tend to give the same doses like in, in younger adults. For pain, we give two grams of IV morphine, for instance, we give one tablet of I know hydrocodone, we give Haldol, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five milligrams even. So please keep in mind, when you have all the adults, you give the lowest possible dose and you start with the lowest possible dose. And I give here, here an example. When, when you have an, an older patient, opiate naive, don't give them even a full tablet of hydrocodone if you want to give, treat pain by mouth, just give half of a tablet. Keep in mind that these, these uh, tablets have five milligrams of hydrocodone, and then there is actually a 2.5 milligram tablet hydrocodone. So go with whatever you think is appropriate. You look at the patient's age, you look at how they function. And also for the morphine, actually just go with the lowest dose, like 0.5 milligrams of morphine, IV, you can give it every hour, PRN. The nurses, if, if the nurse needs more, she will call you if the patient is not, the pain is not controlled, okay? Um, I wanted uh, also to mention the Haldol. I've seen again, given in high doses, always start low, and we'll talk when we need to give Haldol to older patients. Start low, like 0.5 milligrams IV or PO if for you treat delirium. And then you can give every hour, every two hours PRN. And again, you are there in the hospital, the, the, the dose can be increased as needed. Another medication that is given often is Tylenol, either with uh, the opiates, the hydrocodone and the Tylenol, acetaminophen, or just by itself. So just 
don't forget, either in, in the hospital as an, or an, as an outpatient, to, oops, sorry, uh, to give the Tylenol uh, is uh, uh, to limit for adult, for older adults. So if you see a 80, 90 year old adult, uh, limit to two grams from all sources in 24 hours, and then you should mention it actually um, in records. And you can also, when you write a prescription for for the opiates, you can say limit Tylenol to two grams in 24 hours because the patient is taking other drugs that, that have Tylenol in them or just Tylenol by themselves, okay? Um, so Beer's criteria, as I mentioned, I, um, I uh, gave you some handouts. This was, this is actually a list, a list of with uh, medications that we should pay attention to in older adults. This was developed by Dr. Mark Beer. He was um, uh, he was uh, an, an um, geriatrician in 1991, and he worked with an expert panel, and he wanted to target initially nursing home residents because he noticed that many patients uh, they are, are getting medications that they should not be on, actually. So um, in it, it was presented as a list of medications that were considered inappropriate for older patients, either because they had side effects or because the medication didn't ha have effect on these older people, and also because of the high risk for uh, adverse effects. So um, there are some revisions, 97, 2003. The recent one is 2012, and I gave you one from 2012. And this is the Beers criteria is actually used now uh, for um, to monitor the quality of care for older adults. So how they are doing, if they are using medications that are not on Beers criteria, you know, in research. So, and you can find uh, actually this uh, this list on uh, American American Geriatric Society website. There are 53 medications actually that uh, are. Um, that are in, uh, designated in three ca categories. And this one, the third one, is a new one that was not present before. And if you want to look at the, um, at the table that you have in, in the handout, uh, there are the, the first one is to avoid um, uh, medications uh, due to side effects or limited effectiveness. And uh, in the table there, you have many drugs, and I mentioned also some, uh, here, if you want to look in your handout, that would be great. It's the uh, anticholinergics, um, then antispasmodics, belladonna, uh, propantaline, scopolamine. There are some antithrombotics, dipyridamol, and then cardiovascular, alpha blockers, antiarrhythmics. So you'll notice amiodarone is there, although we give it to older people, and I'll talk a little bit about that too and many others. Spironolactone, also medication that is given, um, is, the, is mentioned there. And then uh, tricyclic antidepressants um, like amitriptyline uh, is one of the medications that we don't want to give in older adults. And then, so the list goes on. So then there is the other, uh, the other, which, uh, the other table, if you go on page nine actually, is medications that we give uh, with that with particular in patients we have who have um, particular um, health conditions or syndromes so medications that are inappropriate for that reason and then uh, for instance in heart failure they mentioned NSAIDs that are contraindicated or um, or uh, pioglitazone so this is an anti-diabetic or uh, in syncope Again, um, peripheral alpha blockers, uh, tri tricyclic, uh, tertiary uh, tricyclics, or uh, in, uh, for instance, in people with chronic, with central nervous system problems like chronic seizures, uh, you don't want to go with bupropion. In delirium, also, so patients with delirium, tricyclic antidepressants, anticholinergics, benzodiazepines, corticosteroids, H2 antagonist blockers, so like famotidine. So pay attention to this because frequently we have older patients getting, uh, instead of a PPI, getting H2 blockers. So also sedative hypnotics, uh, meperidine, actually we are not using this too much. Also for patients with dementia and with cognitive impairment, 
medications that should not give, be given, anticholinergics, benzodiazepines, again, H2 blockers, zolpidem for sleep, uh, antipsychotics. And then um, hist- patients with history of falls or fractures, um, contra- that are medications that should not be given, like um, antipsychotics, anticonvulsants, benzodiazepines. So I'll let you, uh, if you have time or you have older patients or you plan on taking care of older patients, uh, look at those. And then there is another table, is on page uh, 12, which is actually um, is. Uh, the third uh, category is to, this is, this was added in 2012. This is new. So it should be, there are medications that should be used with caution. Is, um, this actually, uh, was, um, the, the purpose of, of this, um, other, um, category was to draw attention that we should tailor the, the treatment based on the patient. So it's, it's not, uh, like, um, it's they we we don't want to say don't use those but just use cautiously and with the uh, on the patients based on what the, their needs are and as you know more and more we are paying attention to um, it's a patient centered care and we pay attention to patient um, actually values and their preferences So uh, I just mentioned here a few examples of medication to avoid because these are things that sometimes um, we see used. Antihistamines, first generation, hydroxyzine, phenergan for nausea and vomiting, diphenhydramine. Please don't use those in older adults. So uh, except for the diphenhydramine in Beer's criteria, they talk about only if there is um, severe allergic reaction. So you know we give... Uh, for uh, nausea, we, we give uh, Zofran in older adults, uh, and um, so, again, we, we avoid this medication. Antispasmodics, actually, I mentioned them. Now, there are some medications that we give in older adults, digoxin, so pay attention. Uh, we don't want higher doses, and then, um, if possible, not use at all. And then tricyclic barbiturates, benzodiazepines. These these are these are uh, a group of medications that you will see given often in older adults. Sometimes they were started many years ago, and these people are just on some benzos for years, and actually they don't want to stop them. Um, when you never stop benzodiazepines, okay, by itself. So if the patient is on benzo, you have to continue with the benzo because if you do stop, they can go into withdrawal, exactly like for alcohol withdrawal. So what you can do with these people is just, um, as an outpatient, you will, um, you will try to, you will try to titrate. The patient has to be willing to do that. And then the longer they've been on treatment, the longer the titration. So to that effect that if they've been on, um, benzos for years and years, you have to titrate over months. So pay attention. Um, if they if they have been uh, on uh, PRN doses and they haven't taken, you don't have to worry when they are in the hospital or you know outpatient. You just advise them not to continue. But if they they have taken it regularly, then you have to keep going. Sliding scale insulin is actually on Beer's criteria. We are using it a lot. It's considered like it's not actually beneficial, it's not needed. The reason for keeping it in the hospital is, is because when the nurse sees a blood glucose of 200 and something or 300, they will call. So that's why we many times we use it. But keep in mind that actually we don't want it and we are trying to move away from the sliding scale insulin. Magistrol or Megastrol, uh, medication that is given sometimes for uh, to increase the appetite. Please don't use it in older adults. Um, I think the majority of you or all of you know that we are concerned about uh, thrombosis in these patients. Okay, muscle relaxants, uh, also strong anticholinergic effects uh, they can cause, and with that the, the anticholinergic uh, cause uh, actually confusion. So imagine these older people, some of them have dementia already, so they become more confused, or they have delirium in the hospital, and so you, they become uh, really more delirious. So there were actually in an effort to help with medication and what we should do to help people um, and, then, and then help 
you know, treating them and do a good job, basically. There are different studies and different projects, and I just mentioned just one, Assessing Care of Vulnerable Elders, um, a COVID project, and what they recommend is that actually to document the indication for a new drug therapy. And this is good practice. You, when you start a medication, you should say, why are you giving it for? And then you have to, you should educate the patient on, or the families on the benefits and risks associated with a new medication. And then maintaining a current, uh, a current medication list, very important. Many patients, they go from one place to another. They don't know what they are on. They, and then, uh, they are, they can be prescribed medication that I already on either the same drug or different drugs and from the same class. And then that can be a problem for them. We'll talk a little bit uh, later about that. And then, you document the response to therapy. You think it's beneficial. With that, uh, you also assess for possible side effects that the patient can have. So when you start a new drug on a patient, keep in mind and then call them. And you, when you see them at the next visit or when they are in the hospital, just check to see how they are doing on that new drug. And then um, you have to review uh, periodically the need for uh, a drug therapy. I want to tell you that until I started geriatrics, I didn't know really um, how much um, actually, in a way, harm we do to these people because we don't review their medications. And they've been on some treatments for years and years, medications that they actually don't need or um, medications that they don't need that dose or actually the patient, sometimes the doctor tells them to stop. The patient doesn't want to stop, okay? So that's another aspect that we have to be aware of. So how do, how do you, we prescribe drugs? Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, it's not easy to prescribe medications in older adults. So we have to take into, into account uh, the patient preferences. What do they want? What, they, what are their value? What, uh, what they want to, to uh, uh, what, what is their preference? Their comorbidities. If you have a very sick patient with lots of comorbidities and you write uh, 15 medications, they might not take them all. Most likely he won't take them all or she. So what you want to do, maybe you concentrate on those that are very important for them and prescribe those and then get rid of the rest, okay? And then you look at the life expectancy. What's the life expectancy of that patient? So if there is limited life expectancy, just get rid of uh, things that they don't need, like maybe statins, uh, maybe, I don't know, some other medications, maybe vitamins. Um, so definitely, or uh, diuretics or uh, blood pressure medications, they actually don't need. Now, many times we see the overprescribing, which is the, um, we, you know, inappropriate medication. So, again, if we go back, if we visit that list of medication, we ask ourselves for what that medication is, we'll try to uh, step away from this or under-prescribing. So there is apparently, there are studies showing that in, in highly functional older people, we don't give enough medication that they would benefit from. And this is this is about statins, um, and then anticoagulants, anticoagulants in AFib, especially AFib, and then um, uh, statins in patients with uh, hyperlipidemia uh, or in uh, patients with peripheral vascular disease or coronary artery disease. So I want to tell you a few things about anticoagulants. So we recommend um, anticoagulants for, so Coumadin treatment for patients with, um, with atrial fibrillation, even if they are old. And they have increased risk of bleeding, but apparently the risk of stroke is higher than the risk of bleeding. So what you actually should do, you should talk to the patient and families about the risk, the, the risk of bleeding, the risk of stroke, and they, then you can make a decision. So is the Coumadin or is the Factor 10 activated tablets that they are using now, uh, either way, um, you know, present that and then you go with whatever, um, whatever the patient's preferences are. So we are trying to move away more from this uh, way of just um, handing a patient a prescription and saying this is what you should 
take and uh, moving to more towards you discuss with the patient, uh, you want the patients involved, you want their families involved in, 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 the, in the decision regarding the treatment. So adver adverse uh, drug events, uh, actually any injury that occurs um, from a drug, including um, administration errors, different dose, uh, wrong dosage, wrong patient, wrong route, anything. And then actually it, uh, sorry, it, it is, um, it, uh, this drug, uh, adverse drug reactions is part of the adverse drug events. But the adverse drug reaction actually are uh, the responses, the noxious responses to drugs used in the regular um, dosage, dosages for treatment or for prevention of disease. So why are these so important for us? First of all, they are very frequent. And then depending on how many uh, drugs the patient is using, their, their frequency increase actually. Some of the symptoms I just mentioned here, the anticholinergic symptoms, um, the men mental status changes, orthostatic hypotension, mood changes, and GI are the most frequent ones. And then what we see actually is what is called the prescribing cascade. You have one of the symptoms mentioned, and then you think the patient is um, either having a disease, and then we prescribe um, we prescribe a medication. Actually, it is a uh, it is um, an unrecognized adverse uh, event from a drug. Okay, so pay attention to that. And then easily, if maybe it works the same for younger adults, but for, uh, for older people, it's easily misinterpreted. And the most common one I would mention is in, Parkinson, uh, in Parkins Parkinsonism that you can have with antipsychotics or with metoclopramide. So think that in uh, older patients or with cholinesterase inhibitors, medication for dementia, people can get diarrhea or urinary incontinence or GI symptoms like nausea, uh, decreased appetite. So that's why I'm saying when you, when you prescribe a new medication, you have to monitor the patient and think that some of the symptoms can be related to, to the new drug. So let's not forget about the drug-drug interactions. Again, uh, depending on the patient's age, number of uh, drugs uh, used, number of prescribers, and frailty, we have uh, the drug-drug interaction. This is, many studies have shown actually that with higher number of prescribers, the drug-drug interactions, um, actually we have more drug-drug interactions. And what it's noted is that the physicians attempting to um, not to modify or not to discontinue a drug that was started by another physician. And this is true, and this is what we do. We are afraid to stop a drug. Now, I would say um, there are drugs that indeed, for instance, Plavix. We had cases where Plavix was stopped for some, I don't know, some eye surgery, and actually the patient had a uh, stand placed recently, and then re he had a retrom thrombosis, instant thrombosis, thrombosis. So, or there are different drugs that have uh, really an impact on the patient's health. But there are others that have been taken for something. So, for instance, and I'll give you an example. For instance, we have patients being discharged from the hospital on Seroquel because they were uh, delirious, and then they go on Seroquel. Nobody will discontinue Seroquel for months and months. And actually, this is a, a, a dangerous drug, okay? I mentioned here the increased risk of bleeding with warfarin because this is something that we see often. And when you start a patient or fluoroquinolone as an outpatient, keep in mind that actually you should decrease the warfarin, okay? Also, if they are on amiodarone, if patients are on NSAIDs, uh, statins, or on SSRIs. So don't forget about the, uh, about the interference. So polypharmacy. Now, the definition of polypharmacy actually, I would say, um, varies because in, depending on authors, some say four drugs and more is polypharmacy. And then in general, in geriatric, we consider five or more medications are considered polypharmacy or the use of drug without an indication. So that's also considered polypharmacy. Also, you know, although in a way it's a misnomer because polypharmacy means many. 
But anyways, uh, it's very common in older adults, and then we there are studies showing that it causes um, decreased quality of life, uh, decreases cognition, and uh, decreases actually mobility. It can cause falls. So we really have a lot of troubles with these people. Um, I would like to say a few words about kidney impairment. So I like to believe that every every resident that comes to uh, that rotates with geriatrics um, comes out with some information, and one is that never look at creatinine that is normal and consider that the kidney is normal. Okay, so I know that in younger adults you look at say oh creatinine is one or one point one fine, never in older adults. And um, you can have even lower creatinine and the, the kidney is not normal. So keep in mind that the kidney's function decreases starting at age 50. And by the age of 75, approximately one-third of glomeruli are lost. So why we don't see an increase in creatinine is because creatinine is produced by the muscle, right? So the muscle mass is decreasing, so you have, uh, you have low, low creatinine in the blood, actually. And also creatinine is secreted in older p- patients through a tubular secretion. So is excreted through a tubular secretion. So another reason for have a low creatinine. So always, always adjust medication to, to the kidney function. Um, there, this is the formula that we use to calculate the estimated GFR. Uh, you have to adjust the, as I mentioned, the medications, usually antibiotics. But these are medic, I mentioned just some medications that are not adjusted for the kidney function. And if they are not adjusted, then you can have a patient being more lethargic and you don't know why they are more lethargic. Neurontin, so always, uh, adjust the medication. Don't give in older people more than, I would say, six, seven hundred uh, milligrams a day. Uh, memantine, that's a drug, uh, NMDA receptor antagonist that's given for, the, for dementia. This is the drug that you would, you have to adjust the dose for kidney function. And then anti-allergic drug, drugs like Allegra. You, you don't, if you give Allegra the full dose like 180 milligrams a day or 120, it's too much for an older adult. So keep that in mind. Um, a few words about transition in care setting. So you know our patients are moving from in the hospital from one department to another. Um, they move from the hospital to home. They go to a rehab facility or they go to nursing home. So this is what we call transition uh, of care. And during this uh, times, many medication error, uh, errors actually happen. So that's why uh, there is a, a lot of effort put now into this, and maybe you notice that um, a lot of pressure to, to have the medication that matches the discharge summary with what the ins- medication instructions are for the patient. So medication lists that are accurate, you have to review those, making sure that there are not two drugs prescribed from the same class, dosages that are inappropriate, and also very important communication between providers. And uh, in our, in geriatric department, um, we have nursing homes that we go to, and we are, um, we are uh, medical directors, and actually we talk between ourselves either when the patient is coming to the hospital or when the patient goes out of the hospital, and that actually improves uh, the, the, the outcome of the patient in the sense that there is no, if there is any inconsistency, um, you know, I get a call um, about medication or and vice versa. So that's why communication between providers have been proven to be beneficial for patients. Also, um, what is done now, um, there are nurses that will follow the patient going home and asking them and checking with the medications that they are taking, how they are taking, making sure that they understand what's going on. Um, for, with the same purpose, to um, to improve the quality of care that we give to our patients, we have to review the drug therapy periodically. We have to check indications uh, for medication, dosages, and also you have to ask um, the patient for herbal supplements. 
the majority of older adults are actually on uh, herbal supplements. Uh, unless you ask, they won't tell you. And there is interaction between the herbal supplements and, um, and the, med the medications that we prescribe. Okay? So... Now, a few words about, I wanted to bring this up because um, I know that many times you get a call from the nurse or somebody and say, well, the patient cannot sleep, can I give him a little bit of that, I don't know, Ativan, Temazepam, something like this. Um, actually, no. We don't treat for uh, sleep problems. We don't treat patients with benzos or um, with the regular medication that you give in uh, younger adults. What we recommend is melatonin. You can start with one milligram. You can go to three milligrams, five milligrams. Usually, if you if they don't respond, I'm saying it as an outpatient in the hospital. I don't know if you can do all that, but as an outpatient, sometimes ten milligrams, um, but not higher than that. But usually, you stop at five milligrams. If it's helpful, it's helpful. If not, you move away from it. Trazodone. That's another drug that we give for sleep. Um, uh, um, and then you can increase the dose 50 up to 100. And then mirtazapine, that's a drug that we give um, it for, um, for to, stimulate, uh, to stimulate the appetite in older adults. So it has a strong, uh, has, a, has a, I'm sorry, has a um, sedative effect. So it's very good. You start with a low dose, like 7.5, and then you can go up to 15 milligrams at bedtime. We don't give to obese people because then they will eat more, okay? Uh, with that being said, I want to tell you it doesn't mean that an obese um, elderly patient is, um, uh, doesn't mean that he's not malnourished, okay? I want to, to point this out, but you don't want to, anyways, to give, pres to prescribe this to uh, obese patients. And then for delirium, just uh, a few words. Of course, um, delirium, you, you, I'm sure you've seen delirium or, uh, you know, you will. But, um, and always apply non-pharmacologic measures first. And always, for these older people, reorient them, get them out of bed. Never put a bed rest for older people unless they have some fractures and they cannot walk or get out of bed. But... Um, so outside of this, if you need to treat, then start, as I mentioned before, with the low dose of Haldol, 0.5 milligrams, IV or PO, Q, one hour, two hours, four hours, however you want, PRN, okay, give the PRN. Or you can give Seroquel. This, many hospitals are using Seroquel. We are still using Haldol. It's well tolerated. It's, it's a good drug, actually. Seroquel, you can go 12.5 or 25 PO, QHS, or you can go with PID. A BID. As I mentioned before, many times Seroquel actually uh, is uh, at discharge. The patient uh, continues on that. You should discontinue Seroquel at discharge, even if the patient doesn't have uh, is not uh, delirium is not um, um, resolved by the time you discharge the patient. But you should not continue Seroquel unless you have reasons, and then you should put on the discharge summary stop whenever the indication you think you should do. Okay. It's, uh, this Seroquel is an antipsychotic, um, atypical antipsychotic. Uh, these pe these uh, medications have uh, increased mortality for car because of cardiovascular issues and, uh, and bleeding issues. I'm sorry, infection issues. So please keep that in mind. In delirium, don't give when the patients are agitated and the nurse is calling you, don't give benzos, okay? Ativan or whatever. One exception you can try when the patient has Parkinson's disease because if you give antipsychotics, either Haldol or Seroquel, they can have more uh, extrapyramidal side effects. So that's why when you can try the benzos. What's happening with the benzos, though, sometimes in older adults, they can have a paradoxical effect when they start being agitated. Okay, and as I mentioned, do not forget the Seroquel at discharge. Okay. That's it. One more thing that I want to tell you as a, an observation. Um, when you discharge a patient uh, with anticoagulation and you bridge them with Lovenox, please say for Lovenox to continue until INR is whatever you want to be, two or, you know, something, two or above. Because we had cases where the patient was discharged on both Coumadin and Lovenox, and then they went to a nursing home, and then they came back because 
nobody saw or nobody stopped the bow, I mean the Lovenox when the INR was therapeutic. Okay, so um, I want to tell you that the more accurate or clear you are in uh, the way you discharge a patient, what the medication list is, the more beneficial a patient is. So thank you.